Hello everyone and welcome to this eChurch video for Sunday the 14th of November this year, the second Sunday before Advent and also Remembrance Sunday. There are two videos available this weekend. This video is the normal video in which we read scripture, pray and reflect together. A separate video with an act of remembrance uh, is also available and the link is circulated with the link for this one. We recommend that the act of remembrance video should be used as close to 11 o'clock uh, on Sunday morning as possible. I hope that both of these resources will help you to reflect prayerfully on this solemn weekend in the life of our church, in the life of our nation. And may God bless you all. God, our refuge and strength, bring near the day when wars shall cease and poverty and pain shall end, that earth may know the peace of heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to St Mark. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when this will be and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished. Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are inhabiting a time of remembrance of those we have loved, of those we have never known, of those who gave their lives for our freedom in the violence and destruction of war. I want to think about remembering in the context of the Eucharist. I want us to think about presence and absence and the passing of time. In the Eucharist, Christ is present among us on the altar, a presence as real to us today as it was to his disciples, a presence as real to us as we are to one another. I find this almost incomprehensible, and I think that's okay. Jesus himself in this morning's gospel passage is using what's called rabbinic hyperbole, rabbinic hyperbole to emphasise the scale of the transformation that is coming, the ways in which his life and death and resurrection will turn the world upside down, and also how much pain and suffering is still to come before the final reconciliation at the end of all things. And the disciples are having a hard time understanding it. And I think... That's OK. I think it's OK if we, too, feel overwhelmed by the scale of suffering, the scale of injustice, the scale of war and destruction and famine and disease. We are human beings, just like Jesus' first disciples, and we are only capable of comprehending so much at once. But Jesus is present among us in the Eucharist to comfort us, to change and transform us, to challenge us, to give us courage for the things that must be faced. He has offered once and for all a single sacrifice for sins. 
as the writer of Hebrews puts it. He has opened a new and living way by his own blood and by his own body. When we gather around the altar in the Eucharist, we are not just making a statement of faith. It's not just personal, private devotion. It's not particular to any particular congregation or to any particular building. The Greek word for this kind of remembering that we do when we gather around the altar in the Eucharist, um, the Greek word is anamnesis, which means remembering or um, more accurately, unforgetting. It's a particular kind of remembering that says something very important to the world and to the church. The world is reminded that Christ came to dwell in all its ordinariness, in all its grief, in all its violence, in all its brokenness and complexity, and continues to dwell here. And the church is reminded of the simple yet overwhelming challenge to make Christ known to all people. This remembering, this unforgetting is actually the embodiment of what the church is for. We have received Christ and we are compelled to convey him to all people. In the centre of Cambridge, opposite King's College, on the corner of Corpus Christi College, there is a clock that has a very conspicuous command of time. The corpus clock features an enormous, terrifying, grasshopper-like creature, devouring each second as it passes with a snap of his jaws. When an hour is struck, there is no chiming of bells, but rather the shaking of chains and a hammer hitting a wooden coffin. Time passes and we all die. The phrase engraved on the base of the clock is mundus transit et concupiscentia eus. Mundus transit et concupiscentia eus, the world and its desires pass away. It's really cheery stuff. And this gloriously morbid memento mori serves for us as an altogether different reminder of the nature of time. In the Gospels, there are two different words for time. There is chronos time, measured in seconds and minutes and hours and passed away with every snapping rotation of that clock. And there is kairos, time made special, made holy by God. Kairos refers to an opportune moment, time measured by its quality, not its quantity, Time running on a different track to the clock, shaped by its direction towards the kingdom of God. And this is part of what's going on in the mystery of the Eucharist. The priest stops speaking as themselves or on behalf of the congregation, and she steps into the very place of Jesus. She says, take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood, this is my life given for you. This Eucharistic time is kairos, it is different, it is holy, it is collapsed. In that moment, we are united with Christ and he is united with us. And here is the point at which Christianity has striking theological insights to offer in the midst of terror and destruction and grief and loss. I've been reading Rachel Mann's book on the Great War ritual, memory and God. It's called Fierce Imaginings. And in it, Rachel says, at the heart of our central narrative, the central narrative of Christianity, is a work of torture, the cross, and a critique of the idols our culture makes for itself. At its simplest, the cross signals that violence is not the final word. Insofar as violence makes that claim, it is idolatrous. The resurrection and the cross in concert signal that though the world seems to have the structure of annihilation, the living God takes death to himself and is not destroyed. We are, she says, a community of atonement that keeps its violence in sight and tries to live another way. We live in the midst of compromise. We are creatures of unclean but hopeful hands. It is only when we come face to face with Christ in the Eucharist that we remember who we are, what our identity is. We have all been created to mirror God and we are invited to turn to face him despite our sin, despite our failings, despite our fallenness, which pull us away. 
When we look at Christ, we are invited to see what he sees. We are drawn to where his eyes lead us. We are reminded that Christ has no body on earth but ours, no hands, no feet but ours. We are reminded that ours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this weary, war-torn war world. When we look at him as he looks at us, we see what we are made to be, bearers of the divine image and likeness. We are the body of Christ in this place and at this time. So when you go out into the world, how will you bear Christ to that world? How will you live on God's time? How will you recognise those Kairos moments which bring deep healing to a world so divided, so torn, so hurt and so in need of healing? Where is God leading you to see his image reflected in that weary and grieving world, in the marginalised and the forgotten? and the poor, and the helpless. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. May Christ, who makes saints of sinners, who has transformed those we remember today, raise and strengthen you, that you may transform the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and all your days. Amen.